Hello! Today we're going to be taking a look at this rather exciting little package from Ishii. But just before we get into that, a quick reminder to like or dislike this video if you didn't like it, comment down below, please subscribe if you haven't, and don't forget to click that little bell icon in the corner which will tell you when I'm uploading stuff. So, excitement! It is the Cinecam um, from Ishii. What is the Cinecam? Well, they call it the lightest 4K drone yet produced. Uh, what this means is we have this. We're going to what's in the box and, and get to the drone last. So we get some instructions about how to set things up, some spare props. These look like little Avant 2 inch props. A guide to the Cadex Tarsier camera, which will give you a clue about what sort of camera it's got on board. The little Cadex OSD menu board. Included is this Ishin 300 milliamp uh, HV 3S battery. And then the little quad itself, which has on the front a Cadax Tarsier. More excitingly, I saw footage from this um, a while back and I said to them, it looks good, but you seem to have a bit of jello in the footage. Maybe it's worth us trying to use an ND filter with it to see what happens. And we have on board, it comes with this, an actual, well, I presume it's an ND filter. So you can see the two little lenses there and the filter just goes over the top. Now, this is no mean feat, getting this thing on board. If you can see here, and I, I will post a, a close-up, those three boards, pretty much everything in view is just the Tarsier, uh, with the VTX on top and the whole flight controller and ESC board below. I was actually going to review the Tarsier on its own previously, and the reason I'm saying this is no mean feat to fit it in is because trying to fit it to an aftermarket quad, this is what I'm doing it on, is I've got this stack just dunked on top because it won't, it won't easily fit in. You see, I've had to expand my riser bars, uh, and that's the little Tarsier sat there, which I haven't, I haven't blown yet. But yeah, fitting this in an aftermarket quad is not easy. So the fact they've managed to get it in something this small is either really good or I'm just really rubbish at building stuff. Yeah, it's probably a combination of the both. So let's go through what the spec is here, because it's a normal 85mm sort of whoop style quad, although off C a lot heavier, so it's a, a Cine Whoop style, obviously. These are 1103 7000 kV motors. The flight controller, I must mention, because it is the Crazy Bee uh, F4 board. And every time I review a quad with one of these boards, and I've reviewed a lot of them, I get a lot of comments saying, wouldn't touch that with a barge pole, Crazy Bee boards keep exploding. Now, this might be true um, for other people, but so far I've had like nine or 10 quads that use these. I fly them pretty hard and I've yet to have a failure. So I don't know if I've just been really lucky, which seems unlikely because I normally get the crappy ones, or there was a problem which has been solved and now they're better. So if you've had problems with a Crazy B F4 board, I'm really interested to know if it was something quite current or it was a while ago, or you know, it's just happened yesterday, it blew up. Uh, uh, please post in the comments, let other people know what you've got with them, because I can only judge it on what I've flown so far, and so far it seems fine. Um, I mean, the only downside of them is that they, uh, they use the SPI-based receiver, so the, the range is limited because of that, but it's, it's not bad, it's at least 100 metres. I mean, it quotes itself as being 300 metres. I wouldn't be so confident in that, but you can get 100 metres, and of course the idea with this is it's less acro and, and I, well, I think, more sort of nicely gently going around trying to get lovely video in your sort of 1080 or 4k or whatever so within that crazy view board is is the onboard esc which will take up to uh, 10 amps per motor in fact it's uh, slightly more on burst 12.5 we, we have the uh, spi bus receiver as i say it's well it's not a receiver it's just built in they do do a free sky type and uh, even a crossfire type which is going to be much better for decent range and you can you can get it without receiver so you can put your own one in 25 to 200 milliwatt vtx uh, 40 channel controllable by smart audio all good there and of course the tarsier itself which has its own little wi-fi antenna at the front so you can connect to it for an app it's got a couple of little buttons here and it's got the sd card slot just about reachable there so what the tarsier can do is 4k video at 30 frames per second 1080p at 60 frames per second and even 90 frames per second uh, 720p at 120 frames per second if you want to go down that route uh, it's also got a 2.7k mode at uh, 4.3 uh, ratio at 60 frames per second which is a weird one but i guess you can stretch it out if you want to so of course the other interesting thing about the tarsier 
which should be one up on things like the Turtle V2, is yeah, I like the video the Turtle could get, but the live picture from the FPV camera was, was awful. It was really hard to see. If you were flying through any woods or anything, twigs were completely invisible. These two lenses, one is the HD recording lens, one is the live FPV camera, and the idea is that live footage is as good as regular FPV camera. You don't have to compromise on the quality there. So that will be an interesting one to test. So uh, let's get up and beta flight first, see what we need to do. We can take it for a, a little fly around the house in the garden just to see how the quad feels, and then take it out for a proper flight. Okay, well here we are in beta flight, and let's connect. First thing to notice about this one, it's using a proper version of the firmware. So 404 means we're up to date and using the 1051 version of the configurator. I also noticed that as soon as you go to a proper version of the configurator, the bind command changes. So previously we were using just the bind command. If you try this in the current version, it says what? So you have to use um, a slightly different command. So I'm just going to put my radio in bind and you then type bind rx spi. That should be about it. Type save. I just wanted to mention that because it's just a very slight update from uh, what it was before. Anyway, let's connect in and see what we've got. Our quads all connected. The USB slot is at the bottom again, which is why it looks like it's up on its end. Ports wise, we've got the USB and uh, the VTX on smart audio there. Convig, uh, motor stop on by default. I like that. An 8K, 8K loop, uh, arming angle of 180, all good stuff there. Uh, I'd obviously just change the craft name. We've got SPI RX support with FreeSky D, which is the one to use. And I probably turn on RX set there, but uh, not too much to check there. Battery wise, I'm going to up the max cell voltage to 4.5, probably drop the min cell voltage just because it's an HV battery and sometimes reads a little bit high. Pit tuning doesn't look quite the same as per normal, but I might just up the super rate a little bit, or I might just leave it because this is a little bit more gentler than normal. They've they've just messed at least with the super rate a bit, and looks like they've done stuff with the P and the D at least. So that's good. Receiver wise, well, looks like that bind worked fine. This channel map is wrong for me. I am A E T R, and that's why. At the moment the quad is doing this like a lunatic modes they've got just a few set up i'm gonna obviously add my own in uh, finally osd i took a look for it. it's actually quite clean and quite nice what they've done there um, i'm just going to change it to my normal layout and then i'm used to knowing where i am but yeah not much to do and uh, then we can try it out and see how it does okay so a few points about setup here you see that we've got the buttons there We've got the USB port, that's for the Tarsier, the actual USB port for the quads there. And we've also got the SD card slot, which is just underneath that USB port, which is really difficult to access. But if we power up the camera, and I'm going to do this using the USB, so I don't have to turn the whole quad on and VTX and stuff. We get this little green LED here and it starts flashing, that means it's recording. So it's it's been set up to auto record. Okay, so these two buttons, the, the one on the right I'm interested of, the first one, if I do a quick press, the recording stops. Now if I hold that in for between five and six seconds, we're looking for an LED to start flashing over here, but not that red one. So let's do that again. And you see, we've now got that green LED. That puts it into Wi-Fi mode. Now, Wi-Fi mode is interesting because we can do lots of setup from it. Uh, if you look on my phone here, we get the Calyx network come up. And once we attach to that, if we go and run the Calyx app, we can go into the camera. This will bring us both a live view, here I am here, and we can start stop recording there, but more importantly, we can go ahead and set up exactly what we want to do. So we've got things like our resolution to use, I've got 1080p60, um, the type of encoding, exposure, all that stuff, and it's got as well, we go into device settings, the start action. So I've got start action to normal video, so it just comes in and, and starts taking video. 
It was set to loop video to start with. Oops, I've just changed it. And from here you can also format the SD card. You can also get up the um, stuff that's already been actually taken on there. You can see my bits and bobs here. Now as far as getting stuff off the quad, which is actually one of the reasons I've plugged the USB cable in. As I said, it's really hard to get that SD card. You could pull it off to your phone, but if you just plug the USB cable into a computer, it will come up as just like a camera and you can just um, import the video from there and, uh, and do what you like with it basically, which is much, much better than trying to get in there and actually get the card out. So what I did first off is a quick indoor test just on a 2S battery. Now the idea here wasn't really to fly around indoors as a, a thing, I just wanted to see how it was set up, see how the camera was. And this is the FPV camera, and that's looking not so bad. You can see though that the um, ND filter isn't quite fitted correctly, that you can see it on the right hand corner there, and it's angled up a bit too much. Um, now compare this with the HD camera here, and you can see that, wow, that ND filter really does take the light down a, a, a touch too much indoors in fact. Also the angle, both the field of view and the tilt seems quite different. I'm wondering if this is part of this, they call it this hardware stabilization, have they basically cropped in a bit to do something with it or is this just the type of lens they've got? Anyway as I said I, I didn't really have time to do a full test here, basically what I did I just took the bits I had here, for example let's change the tilt a bit, let's make sure that ND filter goes on and I wanted to get outside and test it because I had a very short weather window between all the rain we've been having this week. One quick additional thing to point out as well though is the HD camera does record sound although if you're running it with the motors this is all you hear so there's not that much point in my opinion. <laughs> Well, here we are out to test the little Ishin Cinecan. The weather today has been changeable to say the least. We've had several bouts of rain. It's looking grey that way and that way. Not sure if we need the uh, ND filter or not. Uh, since the indoor test, we've lowered the camera angle a little bit. We've tried to push the filter back because that seemed to be in the frame. So I'll do some testing of that, see if I can still see it. But the idea here is just to explore up and down, not do anything special or amazing. I chose here because it's quite sheltered as there's a reasonable bit of wind today. I really hope it doesn't rain. It's not going to really show off much in the way of um, how it can handle sunlight. This would be a low light test because it's quite dim here despite my sunglasses. Anyway, let's get on with it. So in this maiden outdoor flight, the first thing I just want to do to make sure it get to the end of the field, I've used plenty of these SPI receivers before and they always bleat on about having a low signal but they always make it to the end so I thought I'd just double check that. I'm also going to put in the little um, live camera over the top of the HD because I think that's important to see how it looks as well and what sort of pitch you get. However, on this occasion, you will notice that RX loss come in and me tumble to the ground. So I was pretty disappointed with the range there, but I thought, you know, I'll just keep it in a little bit closer and we'll see how it goes. Obviously, whilst I was flying, I couldn't see how the HD footage was looking. I thought the picture through the FPV camera was absolutely fine. It felt pretty smooth, actually. Uh, certainly when I was moving the sticks around, I was pretty impressed with the way it was just reacting. The tune that they gave it seemed pretty good. I hadn't messed with the Super 8s because I thought, I would just go gentle and there's nothing like, like getting a, an RX loss when you're fairly close in to make you fly a little bit nervously. The, um, the only thing I'm not liking particularly about the HD camera and I think it's looking good from the shakes point of view, we're up here in the high air where there's a bit more wind, it's not without shake but it's already better than many of the little cine whoops I've been using with the uh, Cadex V2s or the, the Turtle V2s um, so it's it's doing a great job there but it does seem like that field of view is squished in and I'm wondering if that's what's keeping it smoother. I was just down here because I remember seeing like a whole bunch of butterflies just around here and I thought I know I'll turn around and go low into this grass and we have another RX loss. Oh man. Now admittedly I was slightly further than I thought but this is less than 100 meters. 
uh, yeah, I was low down, but I felt I was within range there. Uh, so let's try flying a bit higher, see if it helps us in our little case there. Though this is not a bad idea for uh, chatting into, I'm not sure if carrying around a little uh, whoop is going to be the next thing in vlogging, but you know, you got it. And I include that section of talking into the quad itself there, because you can see it's quite tricky to understand exactly what angle you get from the HD. The field of view really does cut off vertically, it feels to me. Um, which is something quite significant when you're trying to line up stuff. You can see how much more I've got in the FPV camera than the HD camera there. I, I have the feeling it's probably a full frame center and just cuts it off to, to make a 16.9 display there. Anyway, I'm flying higher here and I'm subject to the wind, uh, especially sort of it gets a bit turbulent over trees. And you can really see that in the footage. This is, a, I think, the sort of shakiest stuff I've got here. And um, I haven't done any sort of flying around less than gently. I, I'm doing a little bit here, but um, I soon come to regret that because, as you can imagine, we have another RX loss, and down we go. Now, you might be thinking at this point, ah, you've got the, uh, the boards locking up. You've got too much uh, CPU activity. But generally not. Whenever I've had this before on SPI boards, it just falls out the sky. It literally locks up. It doesn't give any instant of the... RX loss that this is giving. This, to me, just seems like a really rubbish receiver which just doesn't have the range that I want. And of course, if you look at where the wire is for this thing, it's right in the front and the battery can block it. But, you know, I was out there, I had a small weather window, I was determined to get some flights in to try and show what this thing could do um, and see if I could actually fly anywhere. So I went to this part, which is just flying in between some trees. I thought this was significant because when I took the Cadex v Turtles V2 out, I tried flying in trees and the FPV picture was so awful. I could not see where I was going. I was hitting branches everywhere because nothing was visible. Now this one, again, your live FPV camera isn't perfect for seeing small twigs, but I could see where I was going. I could navigate around and I could actually uh, maneuver myself between the branches that I wanted to do which I think is quite important. I was becoming more familiar with how the RSI worked and exactly when it would drop out so basically as soon as it started complaining that it was low and got to around the 30 something percent mark that was that was my turnaround point but it was the first time I would thought about actually sort of picking out and trying to do shots like this one I'm trying to what if I go up towards the top of the branches would that make an interesting view again it certainly looked quite interesting in my FPV camera but I do notice that the HD camera doesn't show as much of the bottom that I want because I wanted that same vertical field of view there that I'm not getting but you can see here that I'm managing to pick my way around and I'm getting nice and close and I think the footage is pretty damn good from it actually and this made it of course the very first time I've actually been able to come down and land and not just crash which is a much better experience and uh, you'll see that we're getting quite reasonable flight time we're going very gentle to try and get through this stuff but we're getting a, a good sort of 4 minutes 45 with a little bit of battery to spare so you can't really argue with that one well I still had one battery left I thought you know what there's nothing like throwing caution to the wind I had found this little stream it wasn't quite as nice as I thought it was when I got close to it it's just you know a dirty stream but I thought could I fly over it or maybe even get a sort of a vague canyon run, which is just the thing you want with a quad that's fallen out of the air three times, isn't it? But, you know, I was standing pretty close by and I thought this would be OK. I'm right there. The signal's going to be all right. I'll keep a good eye on it and I'll, I'll blast out of there if I have to. And, you know, worst comes to worst, I'll probably be able to pick it back up out of the water. So here's the problem again. Even when getting down low, and I'm looking at my FPV camera and thinking, this is not bad, is it? This is not bad. The field of view, once again, in the vertical uh, resolution of the HD camera isn't really working for me. It's, um, it's pointing too far up still. So either I have to think about pointing the camera down further, which is a, a bit of a shame, because as far as the FPV vision goes, it's looking really good, but you can see everything on the HD footage is kind of being blocked out a bit 
or I try one of the other modes, like one of the four free modes, the um, the, the, the sort of two K as opposed to the four K is is in four free, and then perhaps I use something to stretch that out so it looks a bit like you know GoPro Super View or something like that. But these are the sort of things that you sort of face when when using a new sort of camera. It's kind of fly it, have a look at the output you get, see exactly what you need to do and how you need to fly it. And this is by means certainly not the end here because I am impressed with the actual quality of the footage we get. The little ND filter seems to be working really well. The actual quad itself seems to be pretty smooth. So the actual sort of HD footage we're getting I think is is pretty good especially considering the size of the quad we're looking at. I mean you've got to be careful in any wind conditions and you can't just slam it around like a regular acro quad all these things to be taken into account but I certainly think there's scope there for being able to get some good footage out of this the question is uh, about how we're going to tune it how we're going to slightly change the way we fly and change the setup to give us the very best output and with sincere apologies to everybody that wanted to see me end up in the drink I'm afraid it didn't happen we were able to fly it we were able to get a few little interesting shots and ultimately we came down and we landed safely um, again getting a, a reasonable four minutes of flight time out of this which i think is pretty good on the little 300 uh, milliamp 3s well what can we say about this we can say almost brilliant but just lacked a few little things so let's go through what I, I really liked and, and didn't like about it. So the Tarsia um, works fantastically as an FPV camera. If you remember, uh, if you've watched any of my stuff before, what the live camera was like on the, the previous Cadex HD thing, the Turtle V2, it was terrible. Here's a quick clip of me with the Mobula HD trying to go through some woods and you, you can't see anything. There, there's a link to that review there if you want to um, refresh your memory really really bad i mean this fpv camera is so so much better than using the the hd camera as the live camera i mean it's not the world's best fpv camera far from it but it's easily good enough to get me through um sort of tree cover and know where i'm going and just be able to see what i'm doing and where i am which is a really important thing when you're flying the hd footage you get is really very good the little ND filter seemed to do its job well. We were mostly uh, jello free. There were a couple of little shakes here and there. But again, this is only this big, so any bit of wind's gonna shake it around. We can expect that. But we were able to get nice and stable footage when we took it easy. We really thought about what we were doing and tried to really get the shot we wanted. Of course, the thing I didn't like there is that, that vertical cutoff. It looked to me like it's not really a 16.9 sensor, it's a 4.3. And what they do is they just like chop it down there to get that little sort of strip as your 16.9 uh, footage, which meant that I'm looking in my FPV camera, looking at the bottom of the frame, thinking this is gonna be great. And that's been completely cut off. So yeah, I need to think about a different way of doing that, how I'm gonna film. It might just be the fact that I move the camera downwards more, so I'm looking at more floor than I want to be. Or, as I said, I use a different mode which can film in 4.3 and I think about stretching that out later. One of the two. Really like the Tarsia in the fact that you could set it up via Wi-Fi. That was great. Um, and you can do that on the fly because all you have to do is, is press the button. It's got its own Wi-Fi antenna. It's got its own app. You just go into it, change the settings you want. The other really important thing was you didn't have to try and get to the SD card to take the footage off. You could bring it off on your phone. You could just connect a, a USB cable to it. Out comes the footage. That is so, so much easier than trying to get your tiny, I mean, even my fingernail's not good enough. Getting the SD card in there required like two tweezers to really man manipulate the way around there. So it's not something you want to be taking in and out. So the big issue is range. Now I've been flying uh, the, the, the Crazy Bee board with that uh, SPI receiver in about eight or nine quads now. And it always bleats on like, telemetry critical and yet I can always get to the end of the field sort of a hundred meters I say is good again it's got the same little tiny antenna just here which can get blocked by the battery but this just didn't make it here I was confidently flying along saying yeah I can probably get to the end of the field and RX lost down it goes so I mean I might have a dodgy one but 
it didn't seem to do the job. That is a, a real shame for me because it's the, the big part of flying this is you need to be able to have confidence in where you're going. Because I'd have those those three uh, RX losses, my flying was so gentle and so conservative. Like I didn't want to put it over any trees. I was worried about where it was going down. Will I be able to retrieve it or not? That That's a, a big worry. So um, yeah, if you wanted one of these, I would not get the one with the SPI receiver. I would get it receiver free and put my own thing in like uh, uh, an XM Plus or something. There's plenty of room down there because the VTX only takes up half the space. So you've got plenty of room to put a proper receiver in. Um, even better if you've got a Crossfire system, they do do a Crossfire pre-configured one, which will get range to spare. You'll never have a worry about that going down. But yeah, the, as, it, as it was, the range was really holding me back. I was falling out of the sky and you know I was able to do some flying by by changing the way I was flying basically I was much more close in because normally I don't want to see myself in the shots I'm taking but I had to be that close to make sure it didn't fall out of the sky but range issue and the the cutting off of some of the bits aside this has so much potential as a good camera ship it was surprising just how smooth it was it was beautifully tuned it was just flying really really nicely I was really impressed by the sort of footage we were getting as I said, it needs a little bit of experimentation about which camera setting to use, whether you do the tilt thing or not, but it, it flies nicely and smoothly, and I think that is the majority work, especially on a little 85mm quad like this. Getting it flying smoothly at all, um, and without those real high frequency oscillations is really quite tricky, and, and this does that. So there's potential there. I'm gonna want to do some messing around with it, uh, changing out the receiver, doing something, because it's got too much potential just to say that's a shame it was a bit rubbish in range let's not bother with it anymore because there's something good there that can be used in lots of different applications I think anyway. Anywho this has been the EA Sheen Cinecan um, supplied very kindly by Banggood so thanks very much for Banggood and of course you can find links down below just don't use the SPI one use a different one um, if you want to get hold of it. I hope that's been helpful and I'll catch you next video. Bye for now. Well, you've made it to the end of the video, so thanks once again for watching. If you like what you saw, then please consider subscribing. And if you really like what you saw, then be sure to check out the link to my blog for a variety of ways in which you can help support this channel.